I'm Larry. I'm Gret. I'm Christy. And welcome to Dangerous Drag Queens and Other Deviants. A podcast about the outrageous and sometimes dark world of drag, gender, and sexual identity, and how communities facing stigmatization are making a positive impact just by living their lives out loud. Brought to you by Virtual Arts. Hi, I'm Larry. I'm Gret. And I'm Christy. The three of us make up Virtual Arts, a virtual theater company and creative lab that connects artists and audiences globally. And welcome to episode four of Dangerous Drag Queens and Other Deviants. This is our podcast where we look into the outrageous and sometimes dark world of drag, gender, and sexual identity, and other communities currently facing stigmatization. Yeah, so this next person that we are going to interview, you know, talk about stigmatizations. I met Karina Tui maybe in the late 80s, early 90s in New York City. I met Karina as a man. And in the, by 2008, Karina yeah. transitioned into a woman. So we're going to catch up with her today and find out her feelings about where the world is today with that, how it was back then. And lots of, I think these should be interesting facts. I'm excited for this one. Okay, let's bring her on. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, Karina. So Hello. nice to have you. So nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chrissy. Um, so I'm going to kick it off today with a little bit of a cheeky question for you, but it felt right. Um, so a former president who shall remain unnamed um, is in a video in 2023, and he's quoted as saying, I will ask Congress to pass a bill establishing that the only genders recognized by the United States government are male and female, and they are assigned at birth. No serious country should be telling its children that they were born with the wrong gender, a concept that was never heard of in all of human history. Nobody ever heard of this, what's happened today. It was all when the radical left invented it just a few years ago. So Karina, my question to you is pretty simple. Who did the radical left send? Was it the squad? Was it Bernie? Was it Soros? Does Antifa have a makeover wing that appears at your door? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I think I was Jimmy Carter, actually. <laughs> <laughs> even better man jimmy carter <laughs> he was doing it but you know i as far as time ticks as far as i know i mean the ancient greeks you know would do theater you know only males would perform and all the female roles were performed by males you know so this um act of it's wild act yeah, of cross-dressing i'm sorry i can't give any credit to any liberal you know bernie i love you but you know it wasn't you my friend <laughs> it certainly uh, wasn't no yeah. You know, people, you know, the funny thing is you know i for me personally um i i recently went on to the um lgbtq the center website about a year ago and there are so many additions to the group. I don't know who the who they are. I mean, it's just so fucking bizarre. And I, I say that, you know, lovingly, but, you know, maybe we're just reaching a little bit too far out for identification. You know, um, I'm kind of old fashioned and I kind of like the, just the fact that we're a whole bunch of queers, you know, embrace it, be happy and live your life. So that term queer, which is a, is active today and, and has been for some time, for many, many years, I had a problem with being able to call myself that because it was, a, you know, it was slander when I was a kid. I do agree with you that we do have a lot of labeling that seems to almost I guess it depends on how you look at it, but it seems to separate us rather than join us. Agreed, 100%. You know, back to your cheeky question, Christy. In my opinion, it is relatively sort of a binary choice, you know, um, in terms of physiology, you know. Um, biology is 
kind of unforgiving in that in that sense. You know, we can create all the characters or the personalities um, or versions of ourselves that we want to be. But at the end of the day, you have to be yourself. If you want to be, well, I guess that's an old fashioned term. I was going to say a cross dresser. Be it, love it, enjoy it. You know, if you like to do drag, and I've come to understand that both sexes do drag for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Drag, mm -hmm. though, can mean so many different things for each one who participates. I've come to learn. You know, for me, when I was doing drag, um, it it was a release. I mean, I was this, you know, straight Irish Catholic, you know, born in, you know, um, the 60s and um, worked on Wall Street. You know, I was, you know, a, a jock, you know, in school and all that stuff. And I was like, it was such the thought of me actually being transgender was just so incomprehensible at that time in my life that I don't quite exactly know what I thought about, you know, who I was or what I was, you know, I knew what I wasn't, which was the all American kid, though I tried to portray that. I wanted to talk about something that you said in terms of being, you know, raised this Irish Catholic boy and being a jock and the same way for me here, I was an Irish Catholic Italian boy. Um, and I always felt in a weird way, like I was performing a role to please other people. Exactly. So in, a, in essence, it was kind of drag. You know, it was- um, Reverse drag. <laughs> it's a habit that I've had a very hard time overcoming because, because I had to work so hard to prove to people <laughs> that I was something, because I was hiding I still hide today to a certain extent. I guess I feel that I'm going to be judged. And, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm cautious about how I approach people and how I approach things. But fundamentally, those things that we're exposed to early on and that we're kind of taught by society are extremely impressionable. You know, I, I really think, as I indicated before, very briefly, um, you know, per, pretty much from day one, not all, you know, is right, you know, upstairs or downstairs or wherever, you know, something yeah. is definitely a miss. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like to know more about, were you always feeling that way? What is the progression of your understanding of when you decided to change your physical being? From as far back as I can remember, and I, I'm not exaggerating when I say maybe like, you know, four or five years old, um, I remember always being attracted to my mother, not, you know, in a sexual way, but, you know, I identified with her, you know, in a, in a, in a way that um, I wanted to emulate her, you know, I wanted to, you know, do what she did. I wanted to dress as she did. I wanted to um, fulfill the same roles that she did. And I loved my father dearly. I mean, he was, um, he was a really great man, but he, um, to my imagination, at least, it just wasn't a very interesting, you know, pathway. He really was pretty much textbook Irish Catholic. And I'm not saying that to be offensive to the Irish. You know, I love the Irish. I really do. I, I embrace my Irish heritage, you know, greatly. But at the same token, like I remember my mom setting me down after catching me wearing her clothes when I was maybe, you know, 10 or 11 or something like that. She just sat me down and she's like, you just can't do that there's no reason for you to behave like this. Boys do this, girls do that. You're not a girl, you are a boy. Therefore, what you're doing is wrong. And I'll never forget that, you know, she really, you know, pretty much tattooed that it's wrong on my brain. And, but at the same token, as I kept, you know, moving through life, I found myself, you know, 
reaching for, you know, my feminine side. And um, I, and every time I did, you know, like in my early teens, you know, I was, you know, attracted to women, you know, but at the same token, I wanted to be a woman. I didn't have that part quite figured out at that at that juncture. But that's when I started to do drag as a young teen. Hmm. And, you know, as I was, you know, I remember as I was dressing, I would, you know, hear my mom in the back of my head, like, it's wrong. Hmm. You know, and so I knew that I was some sort of, you know, um, deviant person at that point. I had also started smoking pot at that, you know, that juncture too. I took it on pretty young and because that, that, that would sort of make it all feel better. I, I think it was for the next 20 years or so, I had various relationships with, you know, doing drag, um, cross-dressing, just various degrees. And, you know, I, I couldn't figure it out because I was just caught in this vortex, you know, that was, you know, spinning me around, you know, one day, you know, uh, male, one day female, the next day feeling both, the next day screaming, the next day, you know, I just got to get high, put this thing, everything to rest, you know. And I remember I was 23 years old. I fell in love. I met a woman and fell in love. And um, I was like, oh man, this really fucks everything up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I, I had no more of an answer to who I was. And, you know, how do I tell her about this? You know, I mean, my, my fear was that, you know, if I say anything, she's going to be gone. This was, you know, 1985, 86 or something like that. You know, I was also, you know, keeping this mainstream life going along as well. I mean, and when we got an apartment together, you know, she picked out a place on 64th and 3rd Avenue. And it was the first time I ever experienced a doorman. And I was like, okay, all these snooty Upper East Siders, you know, how am I going to pull my drag shit off of here? But yet I had to do it. So I would, you know, generally leave with a suitcase and then, you know, check into uh, an hourly hotel. You know, my favorite one was down on um, 10th Avenue and 14th Street in the Meatpacking District. Get dressed and have out for a night of partying, you know. Sometimes Sandra would join me, sometimes she wouldn't. I think it was starting to, to wear on her after, you know, this is a couple of years now that we were really together. And this is not a life that she was, you know, looking to, you know, pursue. I give her A for effort for trying, you know. She's actually my best friend for, still today. She's uh, she's good people. Did you come home in the morning dressed in your drag or did you go back to the hourly hotel and change? <laughs> Usually I would go home dressed as I was, you know, there was the overnight doorman was just, he didn't give a rat's ass. I mean. <laughs> I was kind of glad. I was actually, I was very glad to leave there. I just didn't really appreciate the neighborhood. Yeah, I lived. I, I lived on up on the east side for a while, um, and it's diff. It's very different. I have a question for you. Let me know if this is too personal, but so as a man, you were attracted to women. Yes, and then you changed your sex to become a woman, and then who did you find yourself attracted to? Still primarily a woman, but I was very open-minded. And even prior to transition, you know, I had been with a few men and um, my preference was always, you know, women, but at the same token, um, I kind of felt that I was, I don't like labeling myself as bisexual. Mm -hmm. uh, because I definitely had the, you know, the skew, skewed towards, you know, women companionship. But it, it was kind of a rush being with a guy, you know, almost like, you know, doing a drug or something like that and getting a real high off of it. But it's not what I, you know, sought to pursue on a regular basis. Yeah, very, very fascinating. I met Karina 20, uh, 
25 years ago. About 20 years ago, yeah. Years ago, I have no idea. But anyway, I, I, I met Karina with my, my one of my very best friends, Gary Kanata, who is no longer alive. We were best, best friends. And he had many people that graced his apartments. I mean, all, Gary didn't care who came in. And it, I, it was very, during this time that you... Identify, I, I finally, it all clicked. You know, I was about 39 or 40, you know, and it was like, I think I really am beginning to understand myself. You know, Gary allowed me to be honest with myself. And because as Larry, as you well know, I mean, he was brutally honest with you know himself and everyone else around him. He mm -hmm. was who he was. He lived life on his terms. You either liked it or you didn't like it, you know, but um, we became extremely close, you know, pretty darn fast. How did he react though when you told him? It became a gradual thing for me. Instead of wearing completely, you know, male clothing, I would, you know, mix it up for both male and female. And people were noticing. And one day he, you know, at dinner, he asked me, he said, so what's really going on with you? I don't think you're gay. I said, uh, no, I wouldn't call myself gay. I said, but definitely I would say I'm more trans, you know, and that was one of the first times that I was like openly, you know, comfortable saying I'm part of the trans community, you know. It was like another couple of years after that, around 2007, I guess, I decided that I'm going to, you know, um, have, this, have surgery. Yeah. It was the first person that really made it okay yeah. to just, just be myself. So I also wanted to ask you, though, in, in terms of the way people relate to you as a transgender person let's say in the you know 95 right compared to today how do, is there a difference I'm trying to think of the year approximately i think it was in 90 94 93 or something like that i had moved into um an apartment building um on west 10th street in greenwich avenue I remember feeling quite comfortable moving moving about in total drag. It didn't matter who saw me, who knew. It was just I, I felt at home. Mm -hmm. I felt quite quite a bit at home. I still had to play this straight guy because I was, you know, I used to work in Wall Street at that time. I was actually on, you know, trading. That's a pretty rough environment, a trading floor, you know, or at least it was then. I'm quite sure it still is today. You had to have a thick skin. Fortunately, I always did. Um, you know, I had my insecurities, but you know, I kept them pretty well wrapped. There were layers upon layers of, of um, protection around, you know, my personal life. At the same token, not so much my dad, but my mom was, you know, she went to church every single day. And what I liked about her was that she didn't, you know, um, preach, you know, her, you know, biblical existence but you know i had to respect it you know my mom was pretty cool mm -hmm. when i you know like when i transitioned or announced that i was transitioning uh, i broke my foot the, you know um the night before and i was high on i don't remember what drug they gave me at the hospital and she and my father you know came to my apartment and i don't know why but i just spit it out you know, I started taking hormones and I'm, you know, going to transition and this and that. And I remember my mom looked at me and she just gave me this like, you know, blank stare for a moment or two. And she said, no, you're not. I bore a boy and I will always have a boy a child. And my father, you know, really much to my, you know, surprise, said, uh, you know, because my mom and I, we exchanged, you know, some unpleasantries at that point, you know, respectfully, but unpleasant, where my father just kind of stepped in and he said, look, 
this is not the time to be discussing this. Obviously, you know, he's not in his right mind. Perhaps this is resultant of whatever medication that he's on. Perhaps, you know, we'd want to have this discussion at, a, at another time. And I was like, who the fuck is that? You know, that's not my dad. So after, I don't know, two days or so, I remember, you know, calling home and talking to my mom and she immediately brought up, you know, what was that stuff you were talking the other day? You want to become a woman. And I was like, well, yeah, since you bring it up, let's dive right on in. And I said to her, mom, you know, I, um, I've been dealing with variations of this for my entire life. I said, um, I've had a lot of problems in life, you know, sought out, you know, therapists, um, to help me try to understand this, you know, talk to um, acquaintances, you know, uh, that I would meet along the way. And I, I just think this is something I have to do. I said, you know, I'm almost 40 years old. I'm single. I have, you know, no real prospects in my life in terms of coupling. And uh, I've been living a double life, essentially, with you and the family, you know, and I can't do it anymore. I said, it's really hard. I forget exactly what she said, but it, it amounted to, no, you're not, and then hung up the phone. We had uh, several weeks, several months of, you know, real kind of chilly discussions, interactions, you know, it was quite difficult. But I was also at the same time, I was really mindful that it's not just difficult for me, it's difficult for, really difficult for her too. You know, my father, yeah, just surprised me. He was, he was so much more, I don't know if I want to use the word understanding or just accepting. Postoperatively, you know, he asked me, you know, some really interesting questions. You know, he said, well, do you have a vagina now? And I said, yes. He said, does that mean you have a uterus now? Can you bear children? I said, no, it only goes so far. And then you remember he asked me, he said, well, then what was the um, necessity of, and he was struggling, you know, for words of getting a vagina. I was like, oh, dad. <laughs> <laughs> God, how do I answer that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Right, and is it getting a vagina or losing a penis? I mean, it becomes like all of these kinds of things that you have to ask. I, I, I just want to say, though, about dads is that they seem really disconnected in at certain moments, and then they kind of, like in a baseball game, slide into home plate and... <laughs> you know are there with these words that you can't believe are coming out of their mouths oh my god god yeah yeah my pop man he really he really surprised me yeah yeah and it's always nice when that happens because it's so un really so unexpected i hope to be that kind of father with my son i can only stumble so much before i'm like Whoever the fuck you are, it's fine. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that, that's what's important, right? Going Just back to what we said there. Yeah. As long as we all get there. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I, I have a hard time with is uh, when folks opt for the pronouns of they, them, I'm like, that really doesn't work for me, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'll try it, I, you know, but don't get bent out of shape if I screw this up, you know, because I'm telling you, I will screw it up. I remember early on for me, um, after, you know, I transitioned um, for about the first, I don't know, three, five years or so, you know, my voice is my voice. I never made much effort to, you know, go out and change it, you know, and um, one, of the, one of the things that I had to teach myself early on and this goes back to um, when I was, you know, um, first started doing drag and going out publicly doing drag was that, you know, um, people are going to have some stuff to say, you know, society is going to have opinions. Most of them, if not all of them, will be, you know, negative. And um, 
I have to really learn how to say, you know, so to speak, I'm rubber, you're glue, you know, <laughs> and uh, just not let it get to me. But after I transitioned, I got hung up on pronouns big time. And I remember if somebody would say, you know, call me he, I would be like, don't call me that. Do I look like a he? And now I don't care what people think. I'm more, you know, self-conscious about being overweight than I am about, you know, somebody mixing up, you know, my pronoun or not, you know. Um, <laughs> How our priorities change. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck it, you know, I, I need to be comfortable, you know, and this is me. It doesn't come without, you know, incident. A few years ago, some guy, and I was in Home Depot, and he just looked at me, and he poked me in the chest, and he said, I don't like people like you. Just, like, gave me this real gnarly stare down, you know. And I was, like, shitting in my pants. I thought I was going to get beaten up, and... um I, I was affected, pretty ill affected by that for a few weeks. And then I was like, okay, it happened. I survived. You know, I have to imagine there's a lot of people that I've encountered along the way in the last many years that have probably felt the same way, but just didn't articulate it as that bloke did. You know, it's a cruel world. That saying, I think, holds a lot of um, validity. I'm sure in every you know, phase of uh, human existence, you know, there's been some reason to, you know, apply, you know, the ugliness or the uglier side of life, you know, upon somebody, you know, who's just different for, for whatever reason. I really do just try to mind my own business and, you know, move about, you know, respectfully. Um, I have a hard time with, you know, Trumpers since we brought this up a little bit, not to get into a political, you know, thing, but it just, you know, flabbergasts me how folks can, you know, just be so cruel. And I'm not saying just to me, I mean, I mean, like to, to society at large, you know, and I'm not quite sure if it's any different than a hundred years ago or 200 years ago or what have you, you know, humans have been, you know, messing each other up, for, you know, since time ticked, you know, why? I don't know. I think people are afraid of other people. They're afraid they're going to take something from them. They're afraid that that existence pushes them out of existence. I don't know. I don't have complete understanding of all of the things of that people are, but I do have an understanding that you should respect that they want to be that way. In the same way that I, listen, if those people want to be that way, they can be that way. They just shouldn't hurt other people by doing it. Uh, exactly. I mean, you know, um, this newfound freedom for themselves to, you know, be Trumpy, you know, um, Knock yourself out if that's who you are. Just, you know, keep it out of my backyard. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, as getting back to our original and you know thread of, it, it's really important to just be yourself. Please, let's talk again soon. And thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Christy. Such a pleasure. Yes. Nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> Karina is exactly the same person as I remember, but uh, yes, a very, a very fascinating person and a perspective on life and transgender that I, you know, you just don't, I don't understand it well enough. So, you know, it seems educational to me as well, but she's a person very well spoken and who has a huge heart. You know, I can't remember where I heard this, but I, it kind of recently just clicked for me um, what gender dysphoria is, because I remember when I had a really short haircut and, you know, I wasn't developed yet or anything. So I, people just thought I was a boy and they would 
say, oh, thank you, Sonny, or something like that. And I remember that feeling of, no, I'm not a boy. This is, you're wrong. I don't like when you call me that. And it it finally clicked of like, if you're in your skin and you know that you're a girl and everybody's insisting you're a boy, of course, that's going to make you uncomfortable and not feel right in your skin. I literally, at, from then on, I was like, I'm never cutting my hair short again. And I think I had long hair until like senior year of high school because I was so afraid to be misgendered. I was often misgendered when I was a kid, but on the phone. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, thank you, Mrs. Pellegrini. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've tried to lose all of those things from my interactions with people today, but yeah. they're hard. They're hard for me to lose because I've always said thank you, ma'am, and yes, sir, and and thought of it as being respectful. And today, it it isn't always. Mm, sure. Yeah, you're right. We're, our perspective has changed on how we approach things. Sort of what you were saying to Karina that this next generation almost comes in with instead of what do the neighbors think that's not even in the vocabulary anymore it just you know the assumptions and the norms are we're realizing they they just need to sort of you, you can have your own certainly within your own family but they they they're just sort of going by the wayside now we we don't default to them anymore which is kind of nice yeah i mean it's certainly it's it's the way that it is i wanted to I'll also just talk, if we could, about this Project 2025. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So on the LGBTQ plus rights. Okay, so I didn't even add the IA. But um, make federal government establish marriage between a man and a woman as the ideal natural family structure. Okay, I'm fucked with that one. Um, withdraw federal anti-discrimination protections for transgender students. And then re-implement Trump's transgender military ban and expel transgender service members. So And that'll that'll be just the start. You know, if they get to that, then he's gonna want to try to get transgender people out of all kind of governmental positions, I imagine. They want to change the federal um positions to something that change per administration so that right. Trump right. can put in anyone he wants when these are traditionally people who are well-researched, well-versed in their fields, have their job no matter what the administration is, and they're the ones who could have the continuance of government. So for him to want to change all that really is going to just upend everything. Right. right. It It creates this whole political film over what we think of as non-political positions. Right. And that's the truly scariest part of Project 2025 to me, honestly. I mean, there's there are things already since our last episode that have fundamentally changed that are going to be extremely damaging. Just to put mm -hmm. us in um, a timeline, since the last episode we've recorded, the SCOTUS rulings have come down where essentially they've made the president a king for you know, lack of more tact on that one. And mm -hmm. uh, just that alone is <laughs> is mind boggling to what the future will hold. Yeah. And people who keep saying, well, Trump isn't affiliated with Project 2025. We don't you don't don't link those two people to get those those two things together. Those two entities, you know, one doesn't necessarily mean the other one is going to be successful or what have you. But bullshit. But <laughs> If you right, thank you, Christina. <laughs> that was the most succinct way to say what I was about to say, which is, it doesn't matter. This person is going to be a pawn of these people with money and influence, and and it's already happening. So it doesn't matter really who is affiliated or not affiliated. The the movement is here. Yeah, I mean, I'd almost have more respect for these people if they and they are saying it. But to be able to say, you know, we believe in these principles for these reasons. But, you know, nobody ever really gives valuable reasons. Juan makes me give valuable reasons for every damn thing I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank God for our spouses. For real. real. <laughs> anyway. Onto a, a brighter world and to um, more fascinating deviance. And next month's episode gets us really close to the election. So we'll be talking about 
a lot mm -hmm. more of this. So join us for the October 10th episode of Dangerous Drag Queens and Other Deviants. I'm a deviant. I fully admit I'm a deviant. And I always have. And you're in good company. <laughs> I am. Love you too so much. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe to Dangerous Drag Queens and Other Deviants, as well as Virtual Arts on Facebook, Instagram, X, and YouTube. And be sure to check us out at www.virtualartsproductions.org for all our latest projects. And if you like what you hear, please share it with a friend. That's all for now. Keep living dangerously and on your own terms.